Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, this okay. is Jim Alder, um, James Alder. Uh, he came in, I believe, to Marshall the fall of 94, one year after I started there. Also a euphonium player. So um, uh, unfortunately, he was subject to my being a section leader because I was there one more year ahead of him. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I did such a great job. He said, screw this, guys. I'm going to go play tuba in the tuba section. So he did that for the marching band instead. <laughs> and... Um, <clears throat> It was kind of interesting uh, dynamic that we had there. Uh, interesting in an awesome way, I should say. It's awesome dynamic because um, uh, our instructor, uh, Dr. Mead, told us that same year, hey, I need you guys to sign up for uh, brass band. Uh, you don't actually have to do anything. I just need to keep the class on the books. And so I said, well, if we're going to sign up for it, let's do something with it. So with Jim's help, we started first, it was a tuba quartet, and then it became a tuba choir. And um, we actually did several performances through the years. And uh, Dr. Mead insisted on calling that group tubonium. Um, and he would always say, you've heard it here first, I've coined the phrase uh, tubonium, tubas and euphoniums. And um, <clears throat> he would always make us wear red socks in our black tux or suits. Uh, that was just one of his quirks. I don't know what that meant, but it, it just was one of his things. Um, and that group that um, I, I conducted most of the time, I think, um, but that group became a staple and is still part of Marshall University's music uh, curriculum now, Tuba Choir. I don't know what they call it. They might still be the same name, but they... It's, it's, it's now, still called Tubonium. It, it's still, it, it's a registerable class now, not just, so the brass... Um, the brass band and tubonium, they are two separate groups that you can get credit for at Marshall. Those that started in uh, fall of 94. Uh, Jim also at the same time uh, was also Baruch Whitehead's uh, um, uh, assistant. I forget what the term they use for uh, work study. <clears throat> and, um, and in the summer, one of the, at least one of the summers, do you still once or more than once when you worked uh, or went to drum corps? Uh, summer of 1996, I was with the cadets of Bergen County Drum and Bugle Corps. I uh, planned to go back summer of 98. Interestingly, um, Marshall had a, a one of the education classes that I had to have for, for, um, for my major um, ended up being, I, I can't remember the exact reason, maybe the, the professor had to like leave or something. There was some issue and they had to cancel the class um, when I was expecting to take it and they weren't going to offer it again until summer. So I had to, you know, to cancel my summer plans in 1998 to, uh, to do that class. So I wasn't able to, to be part of the drum corps in 98, which is too bad because they won the world uh, championships, but uh, <laughs> you know, the, oh, well, it's, I, I could, I guess I could have uh, delayed graduation for another year, but I, I wasn't really in the mood to do that either. <clears throat> um, so anyway, Jim, uh, probably is one of the few that was in the music department that got to to live his dream um just about the time he got finished with his music education degree the spot opened up for his high school and he's been the high school band director of his high schools uh pretty much since and done a, a poop load of other stuff in the meantime so i'll let that's my introduction for you i'll let you fill in the gaps um okay take it away well, thanks. First of all, I, I really want to thank Thomas for inviting me, and I want to thank all of you guys for having me here. Um, it's it's quite a um, you know an honor to be asked to to do th these things, and um, you know I, I appreciate you having me. Um, to go back and give you a little bit more of my history, Thomas, I, I'll I'll go with where he left off um, and kind of go backwards from there. He mentioned that uh, I'm one of the few that kind of get to live the dream, so to speak. I, I was able to, um, upon graduating from Marshall, go back and teach at the high school that I went to. And I want to tell you, first of all, a little bit about, about my, my high school experience, because I think that's going to have an impact on how, um, how my entire presentation is going to go. I attended Greenbrier East High School in Lewisburg, West Virginia, um, prior to going to college. And um, at the time when I started out in, um, in the 
um, the band there at Greenbrier East. I, I enjoyed band. I had, I had a fun time in my junior high program, which was a, a very, very small rural program. And um, Greenbrier East is a consolidated high school. In West Virginia, it's considered AAA, which is the largest uh, category that we have in West Virginia. Um, but it's it's a technically it's kind of a small AAA. We have about 1,200 students, and um, it's although it's in a relatively rural area, it's a consolidated school that the buses in kids from about six different towns. So um, when I initially uh, started out in high school, I, my my future plans <laughs> at that time were to go into some sort of engineering or or math based field. I was really interested in those those things, but my experience through high school band um, really had a huge impact on me and, and made me decide that I wanted to, to pursue music and, and music education as a, a future career. The program at Greenbrier East at that time could be considered, um, you know, a, a, a pretty strong traditional program. Um, uh, and what I mean by that is that we we had a, a strong symphonic band, a wind ensemble, uh, a strong marching band, um, a, a pretty decent jazz ensemble. There were uh, choirs, uh, et cetera, at the school. But it was it was pretty much what you expect from a, a scholastic high school uh, band program. And um, and our the expectations there were pretty much that, uh, you know, you, you're going to come in, you're going to do what the director told you to, because that's, they knew best and that, you know, you, you kind of towed the line or you weren't part of the program. It was kind of that, that sort of deal. And, um, and for everybody who was kind of willing to step up and, and do, you know, kind of raise to that performance expectation, we, we did really well. We got superior ratings at all of our um, concert festivals. And, and, you know, if there were people who, couldn't couldn't hang on a lot of times they just kind of fell out through attrition or um you know uh, sometimes people had bad attitudes or whatever they had to be kind of removed from the program but but generally we had a pretty healthy program and 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 you know it was like i said pretty strong um expectations all around when i came to high school or when i came to college and uh, thomas may remember this um, I'd been kind of conditioned to like, okay, in marching band, if I, if I made a mistake, we, we've just been conditioned. Okay. You're going to like stop and do push ups. And uh, Thomas, do you remember that? That I would just like, kind of like in the middle of a rehearsal, just, <laughs> Oh, I screwed up. So I'm going to stop and do some push ups. I think I do. I think I do remember. Yeah. That. Yeah. So, um, but that's that I wanted to kind of paint that picture for you. So you could kind of see where I was coming from there, but I loved it. I, I love band. Um, when I came to, to Marshall to become a music major, it really wasn't that strong of an ind individual player. I was a pretty good ensemble um, player, but I, I wasn't a strong lead player. And I, I learned a lot from Thomas on, on that aspect. And um, he, he remained kind of one of my peer mentors throughout, uh, throughout the entire experience. So I'm forever grateful there. Um, there were several times while I was in college that uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to stick with the the whole music major thing because I was afraid of my um, weaknesses on, on on the individual side of things. I was like again pretty strong ensemble um, player, a good section player, and I was a good leader from just a uh, you know a typical leadership characteristic standpoint. But when it comes to you know being able to like play soloistically or really interpret music well, you know, and my sight reading was abysmal, all that stuff. I, I really needed a lot of work. So um, Thomas was a great example. He, he'd been an all state player and was, uh, you know, a, a, like I say, a good role model for me Had a great instructor of John Mead um, that Thomas has already mentioned. And uh, we were both fortunate for a semester to have the chance to work with uh, the, um, absolutely phenomenal uh, Earl Lauder, um, who uh, developed quite the euphonium studio at Moorhead State University in Kentucky. He um, went one semester, Dr. Mead was on sabbatical and um, and Earl Lauder came in and filled in for him with our lessons. And um, I think that was a, a another great experience for both of us and the other euphonium players in the studio. So, um, as Thomas mentioned, while I was in, in college, I, uh, I did, uh, end up 
leaving the marching band baritone section and going to the tuba section. Um, but, and, and it was because Thomas was a good leader. He, he kind of said that in jest earlier, because he said, because I would, did such a good job, Jim left or whatever. Um, and the, there's some truth to that. The, the fact was that Thomas was such a good leader in the baritone section, but there really was a, a, a need for a leader in the tuba section in marching band. And uh, even though I'd never played tuba before, um, I, you guys met uh, Dr. Whitehead uh, last week, I believe. And uh, he, he approached me and said, Hey, I want, I want to move you to tuba and I want to make you section leader. And uh, so I was like, okay. Um, I knew I was never going to be section leader in the baritone section as long as Thomas was around. So, <laughs> so moving to tuba and having that opportunity seemed like a, a good choice. And it, it was a good choice for me from a, from a growth standpoint, I got to grow as a leader. I also got to learn a new instrument and um, that was beneficial to me. Um, let's see here. Uh, one thing that I learned, uh, I'll share this because I think, it, again, it's going to apply a little bit to some of the things I talk about later. One thing I learned as being part of the tuba section and particularly being the tuba section leader in a section where I, I may have been the strongest leader, but I was one of the weaker players having just switched over from a, a different instrument. I learned that from a leadership standpoint, I had to figure out ways to give the other tuba players who weren't, who were kind of overlooked for leadership positions. Um, I had to give them some ownership in that tuba section and I had to get them to trust me and buy into, um, you know, to what, what my goals as a leader for the section were. So what I would do is I would find the strongest members of the, that tuba section. And I would say to them, things like I would say, Hey, Bill or John or Dwayne, or, you know, any of these guys and Thomas knows exactly who I'm talking about, but I would say you guys play this instrument much better than I do. So I would like for Bill, for example, to, um, to play this section as a, as a role model for, for the rest of the, the tuba section. So he'd play that and say, okay, we're going to try to interpret that exactly like Bill. And we, we just work on that in the section um, a sectional rehearsal and try to emulate what Bill sounded like because he sounded the best and we wanted to, to sound like him. And that made Bill feel good. It made him feel like, hey, I was overlooked for a sectional leader position, but I'm still valued here. And I'm, I, you know, I, I'm being used as a role model as, as one of the you know, stronger players in the section. So um, through that whole experience, I really kind of learned the value of giving people ownership in in the ensemble and giving them, uh, you know, a chance to, to feel like their input is, is valued and, um, and they've got, you know, some investment in the, the overall product that we're, we're working towards. And again, that's going to come up um, a little later in my, my talk, my presentation, but I thought it was good background info. Um, I loved my experience with the cadets. Uh, are any of you guys drum corps fans at all? Many of us. Okay, terrific. So um, in 1996, I was a member of the cadets. Our show was the American West. Um, and we, uh, we went, I believe, as far west as Denver, Colorado, where, um, where the uh, drums uh, along the Rockies. We, we came out ahead of the Blue Devils, who uh, ended up winning uh, the, the world championship that year. We ended up being third. Um, Blue Devils and Phantom Regiment tied for second. And... Um, but, but for a while there in the middle of everything, competitively, we were, um, you know, we were on top. So that was pretty cool. We also got to perform for the closing ceremonies of the Olympics in Atlanta, which was a once in a lifetime experience. And that's something that from a performer aspect, something that I will cherish forever. So, um, you know, interestingly, I got to do that in 1996. And then in 1997, um, Marshall's uh, athletics jumped up to uh uh, from from what they used to call one double A to the you know Division One athletics and and so we were taking some major trips with the band in '97. So I got to really experience a lot of amazing performance opportunities between those years. Um, you know, getting to perform at uh, West Point and at, uh, um, at bowl games and uh, wherever else we went, Thomas. I'm, I'm uh, you know, drawing a blank there, but we got to see Rent on Broadway with most of the original cast, which was pretty awesome. Um, so that, you know, 
band and drum corps gave me a lot of exposure to to music and a lot of um, wonderful opportunities so hopefully it's been similar for for you guys that you've gotten similar opportunities out of it um since graduating from marshall i i did get to return to my um my old high school and um i've been there ever since i'm, I'm in my 22nd year there um I, the program has evolved quite a bit in the time that i've been there some of that by necessity just because of uh um demographic changes in the area and um uh funding changes competition for uh, for different um like uh, activities for example some of the when i went to high school there were essentially i think three or four fall activities there was marching band there was football there was cheerleading and there was soccer i think maybe cross country as well so let's say, say it was five so now we've got volleyball happening at the same time in West Virginia. We've got, uh, but at the time it was just boys soccer. Now it's boys and girls soccer. Um, we've got uh, very strong, um, you know, uh, independent league uh, softball and baseball teams that are still uh, kind of uh, in their seasons in the fall. So we've got a lot of things that that teens are stretch in a lot of different ways and asked to do, um, which has caused the, the numbers in the, uh, the people interested in band to well to, to be a little bit down from what they would have been, say, 30 years ago or so. In addition, we've our, our population in general has dwindled. I believe that West Virginia is the only state in the entire country that has a net population loss in uh, recent years. Um, this is something that I heard just the other day. Every, every other state in in the nation has seen their net population rise, while West Virginia's has gone down. So, um, and some of that's due to um, loss of jobs, or um, you know, just other other things that have influenced um, you know people needing to move out of the area for better opportunities etc it looks like there's a question there so i'm going to go to the chat and answer some of these questions um let's see here uh there um this is also how we pass notes um behind okay the back. so we do put the questions in in there <clears throat> Um, but I think uh, Warwick started with an actual question. Okay, so let's look at Warwick's question there. How important are the arts and especially music to the folks that fund programs in your district? Do you get a reasonable budget or are you constantly fundraising to keep things going? Um, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, the, the truth is that I'm really fortunate where I am. Um, the arts are super important in uh, Greenbrier County in West Virginia, and um, particularly in Lewisburg. As I mentioned, uh, maybe before everybody came on, uh, the town that I'm closest to uh, and where my school is, uh, Lewisburg, was in 2011 named the coolest small town in the U.S., um, and that was based on like votes from one of the, the big travel magazines. And every year annually, um, Lewisburg is mentioned in a lot of these travel magazines as a, as a cool small town destination. Um, it's been compared to, uh, let me think of some of the other places. Um, oh, shoot. What's the name of the town in, uh, in Oregon where, um, where Goonies was filmed? Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, Astoria, Oregon. It's been compared to Astoria, Oregon. It's also um you know kind of in, in runnings with other uh you know places other like there's uh, there's a list of like cool mountain towns that uh you know mentions some some neat places in colorado etc so um so we're we're on the map for tourism and that sort of thing and part of that is a is a strong emphasis on an arts culture we have multiple fairs and festivals throughout each year of course with covid that's been a little bit different but uh we in our community there's live music even though it's a small town that the entire town is about four thousand people and um even with that 
you know, when, when you get outside of the, uh, the COVID situation that we're currently in, there's live music in uh, multiple venues just about every night. There's, um, we have the state's only um, year-round professional theater. And, um, you know, there's, there are, there, there is emphasis there for that. We have a, um, as far as funding for our arts programs in the school, we have a, um, a countywide levy that um, puts, puts money into the schools and helps us, uh, you know, injects a little bit extra money into our, our band budget and that sort of thing. So we have that. But if you were to compare our budget to um, budgets in places with a, a larger tax base, a larger population, it, it would still be minuscule. So, you know, my, my middle school director and I talk about this and we, we kind of say, you know, we're a big fish in a small pond in that, you know, for our area, we're pretty fortunate. But when you look at things, um, you know, in a larger nationwide um, bubble, uh, we're still kind of at the bottom of the barrel. So um, we do spend a lot of time most years fundraising to keep things going. We also have to like really prioritize and say, okay, you know, is, is this trip more important for us or is it more important? I see that there is a thing about uh, uh, developing double read musicians and, you know, I just had to make a decision, uh, you know, last year it's like, okay, am I going to use this money to, um, you know, to um, purchase uh, new drum carriers for the drum line, or am I going to use this money to, um, to buy a new bassoon and oboe? And actually I bought the bassoon and oboe. Um, I figured the drum line could sweat it out another year or two with the old uh, drum harnesses. Um, we do have a band booster organization and it's a, it's a good organization with COVID. It's been uh, honestly a little bit limited and that's okay. We've been, we have not been allowed to fundraise over the past year. Um, no. And that's not just us. That's every organization scholastically in the County fundraising has been off the table um, for multiple reasons. One is they don't want kids going out into the community asking uh, for, um, you know, to sell things or, or whatever when we've got potential, um, you know, illness going around. And the other, uh, the other bigger reason is that um, a lot of people are financially in impacted by COVID and we, like the school system really doesn't want any of its organizations to be, um, known as like kind of going and begging for money when everybody's uh, everybody's short on it. So, um, you know, from a, a, a reputation standpoint, they don't want to get calls at the board office saying, hey, why are your band kids or your football kids or whoever coming and, you know, asking us for money when, you know, when our business has been closed for six months or whatever a year. So, um, you know, to to answer works uh, last question there we have an excellent band booster organization but they've kind of been on hold for the last year and I'm, I'm curious myself as to see how well um that recoups as we're we're allowed to come back into uh, you know doing some fundraising and and offering kids opportunities um you know outside the community um the question on how how do i develop double re musicians who wish to participate in orchestra in the fall and went on some in the spring Okay, so um, having the small school that we have, I, again, it's large for our area, but it's still small statewide. Um, we do not have the funding to have an orchestra program. Um, we, basically, we have our symphonic band program, our marching band program. There's some other things I'll talk about, but uh, the, I'm, the, I'm the sole instrumental director at the school, and there's not, there's not money in the budget or space in our facilities for a rehearsal to, uh, or for an orchestra to rehearse with a, a separate instructor. And I don't have room in my schedule to, um, to take that on. So we do not have an orchestra for those reasons. Um, so our double read musicians, typically um, in the fall, uh, we do still do some some small symphonic band um, material in the fall, although the, the big emphasis, like it is anywhere else during the fall, is uh, is marching band. So if I've got a double read player who, um, you know, wants to be involved with marching band, 
I, there's a lot of opportunities there. Some of them play saxophone. Some of them are in the color guard or playing um, mallet percussion, things like that. You know, um, we try to make it work for whoever wants to be involved that way and try to still give them opportunities to work on their double read um, stuff. Um, I, I had a, an all state bassoon player is all state three out of four years, uh, a few years back. And, um, he also uh, participated in uh, a regional orchestra that wasn't part of the scholastic system. It was just an independent group. So, um, you know, we try to provide those opportunities if, if people are, are interested in that. I, I don't know if they answer your question very well or not, but, uh, but you know, we, okay. All right. Um, let's see here. I, I'm trying to think of other background info that would be, valid. I, I'm going to be talking a lot about my programs in the in the presentation. So I've kind of held back a little bit on some of those things. Any questions about what I've said so far, um, you know, that may be helpful to answer before we get into to the, the big part of the presentation? Uh, just one, Jim, is there a community band on the south side of the state where you are? The uh, the closest community band is in Mercer County, which um, from me, um, drive wise, of course, Thomas, you'd be familiar with this to some extent, but it's it's about an hour and a half from where I am. Um, and because of the the times that they schedule their rehearsals, it's not something that's feasible for me to, to get to. I'd have to, like, you know, cancel some of the things that I'm involved with locally in order to be able to participate there. But um, that's that's about the closest community band there is. However, um, in our town located in Lewisburg, uh, that's the home base for the West Virginia Jazz Orchestra, which is a um, you know, it's a, it's a bassy style big band. And um, and it's led by the um, actually our superintendent of schools, who is a former band director. He was my band director when I was in high school and now he's our superintendent and he leads the the West Virginia Jazz Orchestra. I have participated in that in past years. Um, as my kids have gotten older and more involved with things, I've I've taken time off from that so I can spend you know more time with them, in addition to my uh, my duties at the school. Uh, just curious, I, I I I didn't go down to that side of the state too often. I know it's it's kind of funny. It that it, it was only you're about what three hours from Huntington. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, and. And now I drive three hours or I was driving three hours just to get to work. <laughs> right. But, you know, growing up, that was a, that was a long trick. <clears throat> now it's, you know, when you live in Texas and it takes a whole day to get out of the state driving, uh, you get used to longer drives and that's <laughs> with, that's with 80 mile an hour speed limits. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else before I, before I move on? Okay. Well, if not, I'd like to share a, a slideshow with you guys. I'm going to talk you through like the, the main points of uh, kind of what I kind of came here to discuss. So this is, says member-centered evolution of scholastic band programs, ownership, relevance, and creativity in curricular uh, program decisions. And some of my words are getting cut off by the, the pictures of us on the side. So I was trying to figure out if I can get rid of the pictures. We're, we're seeing it all at our end. Yeah. Okay. All right. So band is awesome. We all love it. That's why we're here. Right. Um, I, I won't necessarily read this entire thing. I think that gets a little bit boring sometimes, but I'm going to just hit some highlights here. Um, obviously band gives us opportunity to perform incredible, incredible music. Um, we have the chance to work toward a common goal with people who share a passion, um, it gives us needed social connections. When we play music, we feel alive. We connect with the audience. We share emotions invoked by the music. Um, and this is where, where my um, presentation is going to like veer a little bit here. And ho hopefully I, I've given enough background information so that it doesn't seem off-putting to anybody. <laughs> I'm a little worried about that. But um, many traditional ensembles, such as concert bands, marching bands, orchestras, choirs, drum bugle corps, et cetera, use a top-down infrastructure that's based on century-old models. Um, we rely on the creative aspects to come from composers, et cetera. Um, that's different with jazz bands because we have the impro excuse me, improvisational aspects. Um, but for most of our ensembles, you know, from concert band, orchestra, marching band, et cetera, 
the the creative side of things, the really truly creative side of things is often happening, you know, above the member level. Um, we uh, you perform music that has li limited relevance to most professional music, and what I mean by that is uh, is that a lot of our traditional band music, although it's awesome, when you get out outside of the wind band um, realm, it, there's there's a big disconnect. And, um, you know, sometimes that's a good thing because, uh, you know, I think we ought to be exposing people to, um, you know, Holst and Granger and um, whatnot. But, you know, when you look at relevance to what's going on those things don't necessarily although holst does sound like movie scores i think a lot of like the star wars stuff etc is inspired by holst um but uh you know there's there's a lot that just doesn't sound a whole lot like what we hear in other situations um and uh, we tend to pr prioritize the needs of the ensemble over the needs of the members. And I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. Um, the, and these aren't bad things. I, I want to be very, very clear that, that everything that I'm stating here that has to do with the traditional standpoint, that they're very valid and they're very, you know, these, these aspects are not negative aspects. They just are things that I want to address. Um, and most school music pro programs were, reflect the traditional model. Um, most music departments look much the same as they did a hundred years ago. Um, when you look at uh, course offerings at most schools, at least the ones I'm familiar with, you're looking at general music, band, choir, orchestra, and there's not much variation there. Um, this really even goes to the point that I don't know how many of you guys are educators or maybe uh, past educators, but when you look at most state standards or even national standards, they're set up in general for general music, band, choir, orchestra. There's some for folk music, some for guitar, um, things like that. But most of our standards are set up for, you know, exactly what we've been set up for, for, you know, over a hundred years. Program decisions are made almost exclusively by teachers and directors. Again, that's not a bad thing. It's just something to be mentioned. Um, curriculum decisions are developed by district administrators and to some degree teachers, and most creative decisions are made by composers, arrangers, or creative design teams for marching band situations. But members are the biggest stakeholders in a band, and what if they could be offered more ownership? And so, as you can see here, the, one of the big points of my, um, my presentation is that they can, it just takes some creative thinking and willingness to implement a paradigm shift. So when I talk about ownership, I'm really thinking about members as stakeholders within, within the ensemble. Long ago, or not so long ago in some cases, band directors, conductors um, ruled ensembles with an iron fist. Many old school situations, members were expected uh, to warm their parts and perform in a certain way because the conductor said so. And this goes back to like Frederick Fennell and, uh, and other uh, you know, famous conductors that were very, very strict. And it's like, you know, the, you know we're, we're going to drill this section and you're going to play it this way because that, that's, that's the way it is. And you tow the line or, or you get out. Um, the, the demand for excellence often resulted in superior performance and most members appreciate the opportunity to be involved in top quality groups. Um, you know, there's something to be said for that. More recently, many directors and conductors have used a kinder, gentler approach. Um, it's still because I said so, but uh, now it's, um, there's like an explanation as to why <laughs> I said so. And that helps the members understand a bit more about the reasons behind various decisions. Um, <clears throat> I've personally used this approach, um, you know, at times, and I find that when the members understand that they're being asked to do certain things for certain reasons, they're a little bit more open-minded to uh, to go along with it. And so it, it seems like to me in my time as an educator that, you know, there's, there's been, you know, some cultural shifts and there's, there's some things that we need to be aware of and be willing to, to kind of go with the flow with a little bit. To some extent, years and years ago, people were very, you know, open to just doing it because they said so. You know, there, that, that was a style of parenting. It was also kind of like, you know, went along with the, you know, kind of the, the relationship of employers to employees during the industrial age. And I think a lot of that kind of flows together with that. But as you get um, 
you know, as we try to encourage through other aspects of education, more independent thinking, and we try to encourage critical thinking skills, et cetera, you're going to have members who want to know why they're being asked to do what they're doing. And, and if you can't explain that as a conductor um, or as a, as a director or anybody in a leadership type position, then, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to sell some of these things to, to some of the members. Um, so there's a next level of membership ownership that occurs where the director, conductor, or staff develop a culture where members are collaborators in the programming creative decision-making process. It's a big step and it really involves trust-based relationships. This is something that, uh, that I've worked for years on developing and it's something that uh, I'll be honest, when I started on this path, you know, almost two decades ago, trying to instill a, a situation like this, I got a lot of um, negative feedback. Um, I got some negative feedback from members who just wanted to be told what to do. Uh, they didn't want to think about why they were doing things, and they certainly didn't want to have any uh, involvement in the decision-making process or in the creative process. I also got uh, a lot of flack from parents who thought that I was um, you know, not being strict enough or that I was you know, giving kids too much um, uh, leeway or say in, in what was going on with the program. I was told by you know, members of, of my booster program almost two decades ago that uh, I needed to, to, you know, take charge and not, uh, you know, and not be um, so, you know, open or whatever to, to student involvement. But, but I had a bigger vision in mind. And I, that's a little bit what I want to talk about, because it's been successful for me. Um, in programs with a high degree of member ownership, performers help guide themes or selection of pieces for a concert. They have input in marching band show repertoire. They can be involved with arranging or choreographing. That's particularly for uh, things like marching band or, um, uh, you know, if you've got like an indoor color guard or indoor percussion in a scholastic uh, group and other, other things we'll talk about later. Um, students can design and create props for a field show, even have a say in policies and procedures of the band. Um, and I think that that could, you know, go to, you know, I'm not sure how the, the uh, you know, stratification of uh, those policies are, are made for the Austin Civic uh, win ensemble, but, uh, you know, I, I think you know, when you give members a chance to have some ownership there, it, it really creates more buy-in there. Um, in very advanced scenarios, members may even have input on the curriculum and ensembles that are available. And I'm gonna talk more about that later. The challenges involved with member ownership. Results are not often achieved as fast as the old school method. Um, and that can be discouraging. It can make, make you know, if you're thinking about trying you know, something where you're trying to involve more member ownership. Um, it's, it can be really frustrating at first. It can be a little bit like, you know, pulling teeth to get people to buy into the, the entire idea. Um, it's a lot faster a lot of times to just say, do this because I said so. And sometimes that's still the best opportunity or the best approach. Sometimes it's still best just to say, look, we don't have time to, you know, negotiate this. We don't have time to discuss. And this is my decision and I'm making it. And here it is. Um, so that's not, that's never off the table. I want to be clear about that in, at least in my, in my programs. Um, it requires building a solid understanding and agreement of goals between the conductor and the members before and during the implementation process. Um, younger, less experienced members still need a lot of guidance in order to be able to contribute. You can't go to like, say you're a, a teaching a middle school man and you've got, you know, sixth graders or whatever, you know, you can't really give them a whole lot of uh, input on what's going on because they don't have the, the experience or the knowledge to, to be um, highly involved in those kinds of processes. But what they can do is, you know, you could have them involved with coming up with a set of class rules and expectations and with your guidance, of course, if you're, if, if you're teaching that, you know, so that, you know, on the first day the kids come in, you say, okay, we're going to have a respectful classroom. Um, how, you know, what are some rules that you can come up with? And when the kids come up with the rules or expectations and those are posted around the room or whatever, um, they are a lot more willing to, uh, you know, to kind of go along with them. They're going to often be a little harder on themselves than, 
then maybe a, a teacher would be um, straight out. So again, that may be something that, uh, you know, even in, you know, civic organizations or whatever, there may be ways to, to involve people in those kinds of decisions. Um, it depends on trust-based relationships, which must be established over time. Patience is a virtue. But there are benefits of uh, giving members ownership. When people form, feel more trusted, they're more willing to give, uh, give to the process. Um, members who are given the opportunity to be a co-owner of their ensemble, and when I say co-owner, I'm not talking about financially co-owner, I'm talking about that they have, um, they've kind of invested in the ensemble and they're going to continue to give a greater investment in the long-term outcome of the group. Because in my experience, when people feel that they are, are respected as a stakeholder, then they're going to, um, you know, they're going to give a bigger return there. And that, that goes back to the, the discussion that I had about, you know, when I took over the tuba section in uh, college and, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that those people all felt that they you know, they may not have been named section leader, but they were still, uh, you know, a valid and valued part. Um, and when members are given a chance to have greater input on creative and programmatic decisions, they're more likely to drive the ensemble um, to greater relevance. So, um, and, and relevance is going to be the next thing we talk about. Before we get to that, I want to just pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions or any, like, uh, you know, wants to go in any further deeper discussion on on the idea of member ownership i'll throw in jim that um this group has a um a fair amount of it awesome. like we have a board and you know they they take care of the publication and um you know there's a a, a media person a person does finance um, so a lot of the jobs that you have to do on your own or lead it up to your um, band boosters, uh, this group is actively involved and they are the players. Um, and then uh, Robert is really good. He, he, he will tell the group every so often that anyone that can wave a stick, if they want to participate, by all means, take all the Christmas music that he's done for 40 years <clears throat> and, and have at it. Uh, cause he's, you know, he, he's done it and he's done it and he's done it. So he, he likes giving other people a chance to do things. Um, so this group has, has a, a fair amount instilled in its, its general structure as it is. Um, you know, maybe there's other things that we could implement, but, uh, you know, we, we kind of are on that foot already started. That's great. Well, it sounds like you've, you you guys have developed a culture there that that really kind of is in line with the sort of things that I'm talking about here. And so that's awesome. I, I, I can speak a little to that. Um, basically, you 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 know what what you described. Just is, it, it's one of the things that I implemented um, 25 years ago when I became was it 25 years? No, 15 years ago. Some, somewhere around there when I became the the uh, the conductor of the ensemble, and. Uh, it wasn't like that. It wasn't. It, it was mostly what you would expect out of a community group. One, one person just kind of made made all the decisions. And even though we had a board, uh, they could. I. It would be really, really hard put to actually say that 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 they took ownership of it, except for the president. Um, now it's a completely different different story of all the groups. I'm involved in several groups, and and I'm also involved involved in, in their boards, and in some of them as as the the conductor and and uh, the expectations of of of, um, of groups are, are still the old the old model and there's there 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 has always been resistance with with the model that you described. One of the things that you pretty much have to throw out the window is whatever concept you thought of was perfectionism. If if you think the things are going to come out the way that you want them, that's not going to happen. Exactly. And, you know, because you have other people that are dealing with it. And so you have to be okay with that. And if you're not okay with well, it, that's, it. you know, you have to do something different. But anyway, that was, yeah. that's my, my quick two cents on that. That's terrific, Robert. It's wonderful to hear that, that you've kind of gone through a similar process that I, that I went through experiencing some resistance there and, and, and kind of having the vision there. And I agree 100% that you have to be, 
willing to be okay with things having a different, uh, maybe a, a different, uh, outcome in terms of like, you know, if, if, if it kind of goes to what I was talking about, about the, the old school method is maybe a quicker, um, in some, in some cases, more efficient approach to get, uh, performance excellence or whatever, but it, it, there, there are other benefits with, uh, giving member ownership. And it sounds to me like you guys are doing an awesome job with that there. Um, so I'm going to, the, the last word that I left out, I left off on here was relevance. And when it, this is going to be geared toward what I see at my level, but I think that there are things that you guys can probably take from it and, and uh, you know, take it, uh, you know, in, in whatever scenarios you may be working in with, uh, with this group or with other groups you're involved with. So what do we mean by relevance? Um, when we talk about relevance in relation to band, we could be referring to many things. Um, we'll focus on some of the most relevant here. Let's <laughs> see what I did there. All right. <laughs> um, are the performance selections relevant to the interests and the passions of the members of the ensemble? And obviously for your ensemble, for whatever your ensemble is, that's going to be different. Um, I, I'm going to mention some things here that, that really seem to be relevant to my demographic that I work with, which is high school kids. But it, uh, you know, it could refer to topics of the repertoire, including um, movie, television, video game, soundtracks, uh, social movements, uh, human rights, historic events, literature, et cetera. And when, when you've got, uh, when you're, when I'm selecting repertoire, I, you know, I, I try to have students have some input on that and give, give, uh, you know, particularly my student leaders a chance to, to at least weigh in on those decisions and sometimes even drive those decisions. Um, so when we, we select things for our concerts that, uh, that relate to things that, that they're concerned with, like, for example, uh, you know, I, I'm going to get, actually, I'm going to get into some more examples about this later, but you know, if, if we're working on like a, a pops concert or a pops section of a, a spring concert or something, and we select something from uh, a movie soundtrack or a video game soundtrack that a lot of the kids are familiar with and they're, that they are involved with, um, they, tend to, they, they tend to buy into it more because it's relevant to their interests. Um, as far as social movements, you know, we have a lot of kids who are involved with um, you know, different civil rights uh, uh, things and, and whatnot. And so if I were to select a piece that that reflected their interest there, or maybe even refer to past civil rights uh, activities, like, for example, um, Movement for Rosa, um, uh, things like that, they, they may be uh, interested in in those those types of things. Um, also, they're in high school, so they're studying historic events and literature. And if I can tie those things in or make them relevant within the the musical literature that we're we're um, approaching, then that actually reinforces what they're learning in their other classes. For example, um, uh, you know the maybe a couple movements from Johann de Mays uh, Symphony Number no. One, The Lord of the Rings, uh, if they're reading that in literature, you know, in their in their classes or um uh beowulf by uh w francis Macbeth uh, is another literature reference there um historic events there's the trail of tears by uh james barnes there's um uh in memoriam dresden um I think that's Daniel Buckvick, I believe. Anyway, so there are, there are these pieces that that can be tied into um, the curriculum that they're studying in other classes, which the relevance as well. It could also refer to the styles and compositional aspects of the music. Um, you know, we're, you could be looking at something from classical influence to influence the more contemporary popular sounds, perhaps using electronic instruments or tracks, et cetera. Um, we've, uh, we've done several pieces in our groups that are kind of of the, uh, electro acoustic genre where we've got an electronic backing track that's been created and there, there are certain challenges that they go along with that. I don't know if, if you guys have ever, you know, looked at any of those types of pieces, but we had a, we were on a consortium that, uh, that commissioned a piece called, uh, press play by Vince Oliver a couple of years ago. And, um, basically uh, Vince composed this entire piece, uh, which is pretty challenging piece, 
but one of the things that makes it challenging is that there's there's a, a an accompaniment track that has to be kept in time the entire time <laughs> it's it's very tough to to be in time with it so there's a lot of rehearsal that goes into you know into that but the sounds that it had it had it has some some electronic sounds that are similar to sounds that the kids might hear in in popular music and that sort of thing so you know like bass drop kind of sounds and things like that so because it sounds like what they hear when they you know go on a spotify or whatever it sounds similar to, to those sort of things they're more into it um but it's you know it's a legit symphonic it's it's a piece for wind ensemble and electronics um are the performance ensembles and opportunities relevant to the long-term goals of the members how do scholastic bands offer programs that allow members to transition into performance and career opportunities in the real world um I love symphonic band and I, I love orchestras. Uh, but when you look at the majority of people that are working in professional music, they're working in some form of popular music or, or country, or they're, they're working in the recording studio or that, you know, there's, there are so many things that are out there from a music career standpoint that the traditional ensembles that are offered in school programs generally really don't have a, a, a direct connection to. Um, it's, uh, there, there's a bit of a disconnect there. So I'm going to talk about some examples of relevance from my bands at uh, Greenbrier East. Um, we look at repertoire selections for our traditional ensembles, symphonic bands, marching bands, jazz bands, um, and they're often in influenced by the interests of the members. Um, for example, this spring, we're using music from the Mandalorian for the pops portion of our spring concert. A lot of students have watched the show. They're into it. Um, they, they have an immediate connection to the, the music. And so um, that that becomes relevant to them. And it's good music. I mean, it's it, it's you know, it's a wonderful piece of music. It's good there. It all offers a lot of opportunities for me to teach uh, the same things that I might teach in a piece that was written as a. Uh, a contest piece. It's a little easier than some of the, the contest pieces that we would do, but um, you know, it still offers a, a lot of the musical opportunities. Another example is that we have one thing that we have at our school that I'm really proud of is a lot of student led ensembles that just kind of grow out of the music department. And um, one of those ensembles is a, a group that's called Skip Class Play Brass. Um, and they don't actually skip class, but they do actually play brass. They're a brass funk band that's modeled after the No BS Brass from Richmond, Virginia. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with No BS or not, but they are a, just a ton of fun. Um, and this past fall, we got kind of knocked into a corner where we had to really um, drop all of our original marching band um, plans we had plans for like a, a competitive show and being able to like something that was that we we're going to invest a lot of time in with with summer camps and, and whatnot but uh the band camps all got canceled uh, due to covid we have much much reduced timeline to work with and so we're trying to figure out okay what are we going to do that we can play at some football games that uh, the audience would get into and that the kids are going to buy into and so we you know i talked to the guys that that were involved with uh, skip class play brass and i said hey what if we uh you know played some uh, some no bs brass tunes and uh they were all for it and some of the the leaders from the skip class group um actually did the initial arrangements and then my um middle school director who does our our, our competitive arrangements that sort of thing he kind of refined things and, and just he didn't have to do much with it. They'd already done a really good job with it, but uh, you know, he, he did some editing, but the kids were involved in the arrangement aspect of it. And they, um, you know, we, we even had a kid that, that there's, there's like a hip hop rap section in part of it. And we have one, our, one of our drum majors did the, the rap based off of that. So it became really relevant. The kids were able to sell the, the whole thing to the audience and to some of our um, football uh, stand fans, they they actually probably liked it better than what we do in a normal year, um, even though it was less complex. But it was you know it it was stuff that the kids were into. They were they found it relevant, and um, and along those lines, we're actually having one of the students do an arrangement of another No BS tune uh, for our jazz ensemble to perform this spring. Um, we featured commission works and other pieces uh, that 
have historical significance to our region of Appalachia. For example, last year, our uh, top symphonic band repertoire included uh, Coal Mountain Portrait by David Holsinger, which focuses on the mining and railroad history in West Virginia. Uh, we didn't actually get to perform the piece because uh, our performances were canceled due to COVID, but we were well on our way to, to having that one uh, performance ready. And the, again, it was relevant to the kids because it, it was, there were things that they could make connections within our region to uh, the, the uh, coal and uh, railroad history. Uh, there. So, so those are some examples of relevance in the repertoire. Now, I mentioned earlier that sometimes there can also be relevance in the ensemble opportunities. And uh, again, this, this goes back to scholastic things. It's not going to apply directly to your situation, um, but I think uh, hopefully you still find this interesting. Since 2008, at, at my school, we've offered a curricular contemporary music uh, class that's called Second Block Rock. Uh, the name is from the period in the day that the class is offered. It's a, we, we were on a block schedule when this started and we were at the class took place during second block. Now we're on just a, a, an eight period day schedule and it's second period. So we've kept it second, but second period rock doesn't have the same rank to it. <laughs> um, this program gives members the opportunity to collaborate, arrange, transcribe, perform, produce and record uh, various styles of popular music. Um, we also, uh, offer a lot of different roles within the program. There's the performance roles that you would expect for this type of ensemble, um, vocals, guitar, bass, keyboards, percussion, horns. Uh, sometimes we have people, depending on the, the tune we're on, we've had people jump on a ukulele or a banjo. Um, we have, uh, you know, <laughs> we've got a, uh, one of the vocalists is uh, playing vibra slap on one of our tunes this, uh, this term. So, you know, it can be, be really eccentric and eclectic there. But uh, we also offer students opportunities to focus on management um, in the management situation. They're booking gigs. And I'm serious. They're like contacting venues. They uh, talk with like the the um, you know, we have students who are doing this. They're calling venue owners. They're they're negotiating whether we're going to be receiving any uh, donation back from performing there or if we're getting a, a cut at the door. Um, we have uh, a live and studio sound crew that knows how to set up sound and, and uh, you know, they, they know how to basically load in, set up all the equipment, uh, run all the cables. They, uh, they use a digital mixer with a uh, program on an iPad to control everything. And they're, you know, running live sound as well. they've also um, been involved with recordings. And, uh, you know, it's it's really pretty cool. We also have kids that focus on promotion. We've got uh, some kids that uh, are currently working on uh, reworking our logo for the group and, and trying to work on some imaging things and marketing things for that. Members of this class often go on to become successful independent performers, recording artists and sound professionals. Um, I've got multiple kids with stuff on uh, Spotify, uh, Apple Music, um, et cetera. So that's that's pretty cool. And this whole program was uh, was driven by, you know, a student's desire to to make this happen. I used to have what was just I, I teach a, a couple sections of guitar class and like one of my sections of guitar class was like advanced guitar. But every year it changed a little bit uh, based on the kids interests and one year, the kids were like, hey, can we start a rock band? And, you know, there's, there's a longer story behind that one, but we we decided to do it. And it took a little while to get things uh, where they are now. But it's it's our program has now been featured at our state um, Music Educators Association uh, three different times. One, the first time we went, it was before there was any official venue for that type of thing to perform at the state conference. And we basically went and did a clinic or, and the kids did the clinic. I mean, I, I basically managed it, but they were the ones who who talked to the music educators and and told them what they were learning there. And they kind of put on the whole clinic themselves. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, then ever since then, we've gone back twice the, because of our presentation um, that first year that, that we went, um, the West Virginia Music Educators Association has decided to, to make a whole category for 
honors ensemble performances for for groups that uh, don't fit into the traditional um, categories of like symphonic band or orchestra or jazz band or uh, choir. So, and and our group out at that, uh, our group has, has qualified for that every year they've been eligible. Uh, so that's something I'm really proud of there with that. We also have a steel drum ensemble. Um, and one of the things with our steel drum ensemble is that I, I've kind of made that a group where we are every year feature student um, arrangements. So I, you know, encourage students to, to select tunes and uh, things that, that we don't have in the library, things that they're interested in. And I'll show them how to use, um, you know, uh, various different uh, um, music input uh, software. We use Sibelius at our school, but a lot of the kids prefer to use um, like flat.io and, um, oh shoot, what's the other one that uh, that's available online for free? I can't remember right now. There's several free- um, Muse score? Yeah, Muse score. Yeah, uh, so a lot of kids will choose to use that, but they, um, you know, sometimes I have to like go through and edit their arrangements. There's mistakes, you know, but they have fun with it and they, uh, you know, often get, pretty good with it they're better than you'd expect um and so that's something we do with our steel band so uh that i, I won't go on yet there but those are the um when i'm talking about relevance this is this is what i'm talking about there so any further deeper discussion on relevance before we move on okay i, I just want to be in your program <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, encouraging member creativity. Um, let's talk about this a little bit. The arts are creative. Um, the, the problem is that in many traditional bands, and aside, this, this is aside from jazz band, but in, in a lot of our traditional band situations, just by the nature of what we do, the member creativity and creative input is limited. Um, <clears throat> So like, if you look at like concert band um, and symphonic band situation, you know, you're playing published arrangements or, or, you know, published pieces, transcriptions, compositions. And by the nature of that, you want to, you know, the composer wanted a certain thing and you want to honor that composer's vision. I mean, that's, a, there, there are certain um, bits of leeway when you have rubato sections or you know interpretation things that the conductor you know can can choose to to do but in general our whole idea there with that is that we want to regenerate what the composer envisioned i mean when you okay. have are you thomas doesn't <laughs> okay. I no no okay. no I, i'm quite known for cranking the tempo on a lot of marches and um we even did uh, Russian Christmas music one time, and I, I got a lot of uh, frowns from the ensemble because I was going almost twice the tempo uh, that was originally intended. But I had a reason. Uh, everyone knows the tune, and there's that section at the end. I just, I think it sounds better <clears throat> the way... Um, that drum corps did it back in the 90s where they went just supersonic with it. It just rolls better. And I, I've done a lot of tunes that way. Um, I, I, love that. I love the end of Russian Christmas music fast, so you don't have to sell that one to me. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I think I did it the same way last time we did it. Yeah. Plus it covers up the mistakes faster. Right, the mistakes don't last as long if you're going twice as fast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I guess my point is that like the the within the the symphonic genre, a lot of times we are trying to recreate what the the composer's vision was. And and there are there are variations like what Thomas was talking about. And I appreciate that. Um, but as far as like giving the students themselves a chance to actually create anything or be a part of the, that creative process, it, it's hard to do that in a, a typical symphonic uh, situation um, and a lot of times in a lot of the the band situations throughout the country um, you know those creative decisions are made by the composer and the arranger um, in some case the director and um, in, in a lot of cases even with like marching bands and drum corps and things like that it's uh, it's through the design team the members are are just fulfilling a role and, and when i say just i don't mean to minimize that that like obviously it wouldn't happen 
with each of those those things. And certainly when I was in drum corps, I know I was fulfilling a role and I didn't have a whole lot of opportunities to be individually creative, but it was still an amazing experience. So I don't want to diminish that. Um, but with a little creative, see what I did there again, thinking uh, directors and conductors can provide more creative opportunities for their ensembles um, or for the members of their ensembles, I should say. Some examples of member creativity from my school, again, um, while published symphonic literature doesn't give a high degree of leniency uh, toward individual creativity, we found ways um, for driven students to create, uh, I can't read everything because my, my pictures are gone there. So, but basically I've, I've allowed students to arrange for the group when, uh, you know, when it's, it seems like you got the right kid and they're interested in it. And we've done uh, some student arrangements, including And So It Goes by Billy Joel. Um, we've done the Skyrim theme um, from the Skyrim video games. We've done uh, Gerudo Valley, which is a really cool tune out of the Legend of Zelda video game series. And these have all been student arrangements um, in, from students in my classes. Um, in 2017, our entire or almost our entire marching band show was based on compositions and choreography by current and former students of our program. It was really cool. We, we called the show Imagine and we actually tied it a lot together with uh, this is the one part that wasn't um, our, our composition, but we tied it together with bits and pieces of John, Leg John Lennon's Imagined, uh, um, Imagine piece. But the 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 core content throughout the entire marching band performance was uh was made up of stuff that that kids that were either currently in the program or had recently graduated um or in some cases there was a uh, some that had graduated years ago who um who we had pieces involved with there um and this that was really an awesome opportunity for us to to perform that because as we went through, we also like, I, I talked to the kids and I said, you know, we're going to make this about you. And the whole idea is imagine the possibilities if we give ourselves the chance to, to express ourselves. And that was the kind of angle that we went with it. So the, uh, the opener, uh, I told you we had one thing that I'm really proud of about our group is that we have lots of student led ensembles and we had a, a girl band, um, called silent islands and they just terrific fun group of kids and they kind of grew out of the second block rock group um anyway they uh they had a song called pariah that i just it, i just dug it it was a really fun little tune so we made that the opener and um you know we took their composition and our arranger arranged it um did a really nice job with it then uh we we had um uh a guy that had been our drum major two years prior um, who had just released an album. We took one of his pieces and used, uh, used that for um, the, the second section we had uh, there's, there's a guy who uh, graduated from our school years ago, who we joke, he's big in Japan. He's a, um, he's a jazz bassist and composition um, person in Japan. And he's actually had some of his music, uh, which has been featured on um, some of the, metal gear solid video game series which is hey, kind of cool but we took one of his jazz pieces and um, kind of reworked that to to feature our saxophone section um and during that we we actually let the saxophone players kind of come up with their own like some of their own uh, choreography on how they were going to be uh, featured visually while they went through this so they had some some say in that as well um and and so on so on i you know i could go through the whole thing but uh the the point is that really we we looked at that opportunity to try to find as many opportunities for students both for, uh, current and former students to have input in what we were doing um in our 2019 marching band production which was based on the idea of the crossroads you know when somebody meets the the devil at the crossroads to so, sell their soul for fame and fortune and glory or whatever and um, so we that was the the kind of topic there and just jamming one day, like before practice, we had uh, one of our guitar players and or he was a trumpet player in the marching band. He's, he plays guitar in the rock band and, and then a trombone player who's also a vocalist. They were uh, they were just sitting around and they made up this blues riff and this uh, whole blues like 
<laughs> tune composition about uh, a guy down on his luck who's like you know trying to sell a soul to the devil and and it was just so cool i was like guys that's going in the show i mean it was like it, it wasn't pre-planned it wasn't like oh we're going to come up with something here that's going to go there it was like i just heard them i was like that's awesome we're going to use that and they're like really and i was like yeah and so it actually ended up being um one of the most uh you know unique and and cool parts of the show and made it different from other marching band thing so i i really like that um we're kind of coming to the end of this and i know we've we've got about uh we've got well we've got some time left here um what uh what before we go on to anything else just uh, any thoughts about member creativity you have a couple of questions there if you go back to the chat <clears throat> um warren and warwick both asked questions a little while ago uh, that deals with some of the earlier material. And I okay. believe somebody else had a comment that you might expand on. Okay, well, let me get back to that then. Hang on just a moment. Uh, stop share. Okay. And... All right, let's see here. Let me go back to, there's a lot here. This is great. Here, here's the first one, I think, since um, uh, Warren asked, how hard is it to measure what responsibilities your members can handle? Uh, some groups are more mature than others, is his reference. Okay, that's that's a great question. Um, hey, I'm going to go actually before this to Warwick's thing where he says, some of this sounds like the agile approach to software development in terms of how teams are organized and focused. Um, yeah. Warwick, you're you're on the money there, and um, you know I, I actually um, have not read How to Win Friends and Influence People, but I've seen excerpts from it, and it's like the, this is definitely in line with that. So, um, and, uh, my my wife was recently in a, um, a master's degree program for uh, um, for and um, there was a, a lot of focus during that uh, on like kind of employee ownership and and i i kind of really bought into a lot of that while it was being discussed and it just sounded like things that that i wanted to do anyway but it kind of gave validity to my approach and then i've, I've seen things from from dale carnegie's book and i you know it's it definitely um all of that kind of lines up there so now going on down to warren's um how hard is it to measure this comes down to like the developing those relationships and the, the trust and all that stuff. Um, I spend a lot of time with my students and, and the members of my band, and there's certain ones that, you know, I just know they're not ready to handle, um, you know, some of these, these higher level responsibilities. They're not really, they, they don't necessarily have the maturity or the understanding to contribute at the level that I'm, that I'm really talking about with, with all this. But on the other hand, there's quite a few students who, um, uh, you know, are, are coming to the table with ideas and some of their ideas are absolutely off the charts incredible. And, um, you know, I, I guess um, to expand on that, I, I, I want to kind of go back to like some of my earlier years in teaching when I, I, I realized looking back that I I turned away some really good ideas just because they came from students and I thought I knew more than them. And, um, you know, I, obviously I have more experience and I have, you know, I still need to guide the process as the, the overall leader of, of the group. So, <clears throat> um, but as I've gotten more, um, experience, as I've gotten more experience, as I've gotten more mature, I'm also more, confident in allowing others to have input and to have ownership and to uh to get to that specific thing it's for me at this has been a growth process so at this point it's not hard for me to measure um the responsibilities that members can handle and you're correct that some mem some groups are more mature than others but i would say that it's only not hard for me because i've kind of grown with the group. So I think there's, there's been a lot of time and a lot of um, building of trust that's, that's been invested in, over years. And um, that, you know, 
it kind of like stacks. So you get, uh, you know, as a, as a high school teacher, I get kids and I get them for four years. And if the seniors are really buying into what I'm selling and, and if they, if they understand that relationship, then that becomes part of the culture. And when it becomes part of the culture, then it becomes much easier to, uh, to figure those things out. And I think that goes a little bit to what Robert was talking about as well, as far as, you know, uh, earlier when he was talking about how at times there, there was resistance to a, a more member uh, ownership style. And, um, you know, it just takes time. I, so Warren, did that address your question at all? Is, is Warren still here? Okay. Yes, he I said don't think Warren you. can talk. Yeah, <laughs> I think he's got <laughs> limited technology access tonight. Okay. All right. Well, I'll go on, and you, you, Warren, feel free to put anything else in the in the chat there. I'm going to look at Warwick's other um, question here. What is the focus as the overall result for your students? Are you trying to encourage a lifelong enjoyment of listening to music, playing music, short term success in festivals and contests? Is there a one thing you'd hope each of your music students takes away and has learned by being in your program? Great question. Um, I'll tell you what. I um, I do. I, I want to first of all say that you know having performance success is important. Um, and, and it, I think it should be important, but I, I think that performance success can be defined on a couple different levels. Um, there's the, like kind of the ultimate performance success that like, you know, obviously if you're, if you're, um, you know, trying to, to have your group play at Midwest, or if you are in a drum and bugle corps and you're trying to like gun for like a, a, you know, world championship finals or whatever, you know, you're looking at, at a, ridiculously high level of performance success. Um, the kids that I get, quite honestly, um, it, it, you know, they've at the most, they've had three years prior experience playing their instrument before they get to me. And a lot of them don't even have that. A lot of them, um, you know, join partway through in middle school. Maybe they didn't start in sixth grade or, or you know, there's, there's other situations there. Um, realistically for me, um, if I can play, uh, if, you know, if I can have my group, my top group, my, uh, my upperclassmen symphonic band, uh, work up, uh, you know, a grade six and a grade five piece to play at festival and get a superior rating. Um, I'm really thrilled with that. And, and we, you know, we do work toward that each year to, to try to do that. And we fill out the rest of our program, usually with grade three and four material, um, that they can access a little bit quicker. So when it comes to like our performance goals, I, you know, I, I do hold them to a pretty high standard and we push them uh, pretty hard when it comes to that. But I think more important than that, I really want my kids to, um, you know, to enjoy playing music. I want them to, to have a great experience with it and to open doors for them to be able to do other things, whether that be playing in other ensembles in college or in community groups like your group, or to, um, you know, to go on and do drum and bugle corps or, um, you know, to, uh, you know, audition for a symphony orchestra. I've got a flute player that that's her, her dream right now is that she wants to be in a professional um, symphony orchestra and she's, you know, busting her butt trying to, to work on that. Um, so I, I've mentioned before that I've got a lot of kids that, you know, have, have music on, uh, uh, Spotify, Apple Music, um, etc., and that is awesome. Um, I I want to share a short anecdote with you, uh, Thomas. How much time do I have? Do I have still about a half hour, or yeah, about a half hour? Yes, sir, half hour. Okay. All right. So, um, so I'm going to share a short anecdote with you, and this goes back to probably around. Uh, I don't know somewhere eight to 10 years ago, um, I had a, had an epiphany, um, in my musical experiences, I've, I've been, I've had the opportunity to be a part of some really, really great ensembles, um, you know, in, in different situations and probably the pinnacle, uh, ensemble that, that I've been in, in terms of like just the performance expectation and like the, and the investment from the members was when I was in the cadets, uh, the drum and bugle corps. 
uh, I mean, you're investing a ton of time there. There's there's a significant financial uh, investment that, that each member or their family is making to be able to do that. And so when you get that and you've got the that level of uh, commitment, you've got a, a you know a group that is super invested in what they're trying to do. And so everybody is working very very hard to just accomplish this this great goal. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd been in other groups that had kind of like approached that, but not quite, not quite given me the same buzz as that, so to speak. And then um, I, like this epiphany hit me with my rock group. We, we just, we, we played a school dance. I mean, uh, I, you know, that may seem like minuscule, but um, you know, we, we just played a school dance and we, um, we rented a, a like a lighting rig, and we built a stage, and and like kind of just like put in a lot of extracurricular rehearsal time into to being ready for it. And, and we learned like we learned a lot of pop tunes and a lot of dance tunes that were not part of our um, repertoire up to that point. We just pushed to to get a bunch of stuff that that would be um, you know, that would, that would really hit for that, uh, for that demographic and for that particular venue and that, that audience. And, um, it, it, you know, it took a lot of, uh, dedication and time and, and, and investment. We're talking like late nights, people coming in and working on things. And so the epiphany hit when we finished this and we just nailed the gig. I mean, totally nailed it. There were like one of the highest, one of the toughest, audiences for high school kids to play for is high school kids i mean i don't know if that it, like rings true with you guys or not but like when you know that it's that's that's a like a horrible it's like throwing uh you know people into the lion's den or something but uh we nailed that gig the kids like had the respect of their peers they had um you know people were just buzzing off the end of the thing and as I'm helping carry amps and stuff back down to the, um, you know, the, the music facility, um, after the gig, I was like, it, I realized that was the closest that I had felt to that drum corps experience since, you know, since 1996 was that particular, you know, like just all the work that we put into it and the, the dedication of the members of that group. And it, it hit me that, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's symphonic band or drum corps or it's a rock band or whatever, when you've got, you know, when you've got kids that are willing to invest that and they're willing to like just bust their butt to, to make something great. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of a magic that happens and something magical that, uh, you know, a long term that came out of that is that I look back on that group that, that did that dance. And that was actually one of our, that was probably around 2011 or so 2012, um, it was not too long after the inception of the group, which was in 2008. And it was just a, a couple of years before I, it was probably right in between the inception of the group. And when we started getting to a level where we we're playing at like state conferences and stuff. And, um, you know, I, I look at, look at the kids that were involved there. And I think, you know, they were, you know, the movers and shakers on, on a lot of this, and they are still like, I look at that, you know, I see them in my mind and there are a lot of them are still out playing uh, live gigs. Some of them are, have moved into like running sound for venues and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty gratifying. So to answer works question, I guess I, you know, I, I hate to, you know, nail one of those things down there, but I guess if I had to nail something down, I just hope that they all get that, that buzz off of what they're doing and they're inspired to continue to, to you know, make music in some way as they move on. Um, let's see here. I, I, some just I add kind something of quick. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll be quick. But can I add something to what you just said? Absolutely. I I, I think that that uh, from in, in my experience that that those are that that gig that you mentioned was really really formative in in, in many ways. And one of the things that you mentioned was magic. And I, I, I kind of want to want to just ask you the question that there are there, there, there are usually the three aspects of it, you know, the, the, the you know, the preparation and all of that, as, as you always do. And then the performance, that magic happens. But then the third aspect is 
when the when the audience actually is able to to be a witness to that magic actually happening and they themselves find themselves enrolled in it and participating in that magic it is absolutely the greatest feeling ever and absolutely uh, here here and you look at that audience that, that, that you'll find that more than likely that 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 happened that night yeah oh i think so i i really do think so um that's it you know i um i i realize i'm pretty fortunate to be able to have these kinds of uh you know experiences i, I want to look over some of the uh the other comments here and see if there's anything else that i could answer program sounds terrific your ideas really appeal to me uh let's see here Okay, are you trying to plan for how this approach will be able to continue when you leave for newer opportunities? Um, so uh, this is a, a, another work question, and I'll um, I'll answer this. First of all, um, as far as like maintaining that within the curriculum at school, um, that is definitely something that I want to try to have happen. And as of right now, the um, the programs that I've established and the styles that I've established in, um, you know, in our traditional ensembles as well, um, it, they at this point have a lot of uh, credibility with our administration. Um, so if, if, for instance, if I were to leave, you know, if I were to like say, okay, I'm ready to retire uh, or move to a new job or something, I think at least at this point in time, there would be an effort through the administration to try to, um, you know, find the right person to fit to uh, um, to continue those ensembles, and um, and try to, you know, keep things moving in that direction. Time will tell. Um, you know, if I, right now my plan is to just uh, you know continue because I, I have been able to develop these opportunities in my the school where I am right now. I plan to stay there until um my retirement age um and i at that point i hope to move on to uh, maybe actually becoming a consultant clinician uh and and talk about how other programs can develop uh you know curriculum similar to this so that's uh that's what i like to do in the long run but i don't know you know, at that point, it, it's probably going to depend on the demographics of the school, and if that's if that's what the the administration wants to support at that point in time, I, I certainly hope that uh, that will be there. And I I'm trying to do my part to lay the foundation to where that's considered an integral part of our school music program. Um, going on here, music ensembles are one of the few opportunities in education for students to see that their success or slacking effect. Yep, uh, it's great training and working teams. Where the workers, yes, uh, Caroline, I 100% agree. Um, when you've got a kid who's who's slacking, they can see it, and it's not it's you know, it's not the same as those group projects in science class or something or history class where like one person gets an A just because their group did everything. It's like, you know, they've got people beside them who are like, you know, saying, hey, hey, you know, in, in a good situation, those people beside them are saying hey, what can I do to help you, you know, improve? And in a negative situation, you might have some people who are really like, hey, you suck, you should just quit. <laughs> and, and hopefully, you know, that's something that I've tried to, um, you know, eliminate from my program. I want, I want everybody to feel encouraged. And, and um, you know, when somebody makes a mistake in one of my groups, I, I want them to make it loud and proud so that, that we can, you know, appreciate that they, they were given the effort and then we can figure out what we need to do to help them improve. Sometimes it's as, as simple, not necessarily easy, but as simple as uh, getting an instrument fixed because they've got, uh, you know, a, a bad pad or, um, you know, there's a valve sticking or something like that. But in other cases, you know, we have to address technique, but we can't do that if we can't hear the mistakes. Um, let's see, going on here. Yeah, metrics for adults participating in these activities are super difficult. I agree. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, um, Robert, that's a whole, uh, it's a different ball game in your situation. Um, in my situation, it, you know, where I, 
you know, and observing the kids and working with them day in and day out, that's, um, you know, a different situation than what, what you guys are working with for sure. Um, I agree that competitions are not always the best way to enjoy music. Excellent. <laughs> Did the Chicago symphony compete against the Boston symphony orchestra? No. Um, I, you know, competitions can be motivating, but I think it's kind of a, like, in, it's funny how we, we look at, you know, advanced competitive groups, whether it be drum and bugle corps or BOA or, or things like that. And, and we kind of put them on the pinnacle, uh, a lot of times of, of being, you know, great because they do well competitively and, and certainly there's, there's value to that, but as far as competition as a, a motivator or a way to enjoy music, it's a little bit of a, a basic <laughs> thing. It's, 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 it's not very advanced in terms of um, how we, you know, how music works in, in reality. Um, so I, I, I agree with you there. Um, our, our rock band, the only competition stuff that our, our, our rock program has ever done is when we're competing against other uh, groups to be um, selected for the, the state honor group. And we've done that. We've been eligible to do that twice because it's, it's kind of an, it, it started five years ago that, that that's been around. And um, you're only eligible every other year. And we weren't eligible the first year because we were the ones who kind of started the whole thing with the, uh, kicked it off with the, the, um, the presentation. So we weren't eligible the first year, but we eligible the second year and we were selected then. And then we were eligible the fourth year and selected then. And then it was the fifth year and then COVID. So anyway, the, the, that's, and we don't know who we're competing against. We don't know. I mean, at that point, it's like, it's basically, we're just trying to record the best recordings we can and submit them and, you know, hope the committee likes what we did. So I don't even really consider that competition. Um, the, uh, I, our, our symphonic bands, you know, we, we really shoot to get, um, you know, excellent performances and it's nice when we receive superior ratings and that sort of thing. But again, it's not really a competition, but against another group, it's more just us pushing to do our best. And that's something that, that we aim for. Um, type deal. Let's see a huge variety of life experience, technical facilities on instruments. Also many are heavily invested in the group while others just want to play their horn. Yep. Uh, you know, you're going to have that, that, variety in every ensemble and i think that there's valid ways for people to participate at every level if you know and I, that's something else about my groups that uh you know if, if there's somebody who's just there because their friends are there that's fine um if they're just there because their friends are there and they can you know play the you know third trumpet part and you know contribute to the group then i'm totally cool with that um, on the other hand if they are you know, really driven and want to, um, you know, take it to the next level, then they're, they're going to, you know, have the opportunity to do that. Have your students seen you participate in music performance currently? I've always found that made a real impression. Um, okay. So I'll, uh, I'll answer that. I, I, as Thomas said, I, I play with my group groups daily. Um, I, and he's correct. I usually play on brass instruments. I keep my euphonium and my trumpet um, next to my uh, conductor's podium. I also, um, this this past year in particular, I went for a, a while with, with some heart issues uh, after coming out of uh, COVID experience. And actually, I, I had my cardiologist appointment uh, on Friday. Everybody wished me luck on that. But uh, I wasn't able to play wind instruments for um for a month or six weeks or so without, uh, you know, causing some trouble there. So I started playing more uh, keyboard along with the, the kids uh, on that so that they can hear me there. But, uh, but as far as hearing me uh, perform, I, I currently perform, um, although COVID's thrown us off a little bit with, um, I, I play trumpet in a, a reggae funk rock band called Vern's Pot of Chili. And um, uh, so we've had several uh, performances at, at venues that are appropriate for, for students to be able to come to. A lot of the places we play are bars where we're playing late at night and that sort of thing. But, but there's several that have been 
more appropriate for kids to come to and they come and, and, and they see it, see me perform there. So they know that, uh, that, that I can do that stuff. And, um, recently third nine weeks or the third term for our, our um, concert band, we, we weren't able to, to actually put together a full ensemble piece just be, because we've got some kids that are remote and we've got, you know, we started out the term with half the kids coming on Mondays and Thursdays and half the kid coming on uh, Tuesdays and Fridays. So it wasn't feasible to really put an ensemble together. So um, I focused the third term on doing solo and ensemble repertoire. And I did demo recordings on my euphonium of multiple solos um, so that the kids could see kind of what I was expecting from that and posted those on YouTube for the kids to, to you know, kind of check out. So there's that. Um, I, in the rock band, I'll play whatever's necessary. Like if somebody's having a hard time with the guitar part, I'll pick up a guitar and play the, the part there and show them how it goes or uh, bass or um, I'll even sit down and play drums, even though I'm horrible at it um, or, or sing something, even though I'm not very good at that. Um, let's see. But you you had several semesters of sight singing. Oh, yeah. That's a different thing, though. <laughs> I remember um, you singing 12 Tone Rose. <laughs> Everything I everything I sang sounded like twelve tone rows. <laughs> oh boy, good old good old Schoenberg. Hmm. Um. Let's see here. A real question: How has technology helped and or hindered your students? You mentioned things like notation software that make arranging easier. For example, what's the experience? Okay, great question there. Um. So, uh, technology wise, um, I'm very much open to uh to using technology and learning from my students when i when i can um i'm pretty fluent with um with using sibelius that's probably what i'm strongest with in terms of notation software um i i'm also a drill writer so i use pyware um pretty efficiently and um you know of course just standard whatever else I need to, to use, um, I, I can figure things out and I, I'm not afraid to, to, to play around with uh, diff different software to figure things out. So that's cool there. Um, uh, first, I wanna address non COVID stuff and then we'll look at some COVID things for a minute. Um, but uh, I, as far as like kids learning to arrange, I think that having access to notation software has made it a lot more practical for kids to to learn to arrange things because they can experiment with stuff and they can try things uh you know years ago you know when a lot of us were learning to arrange things we were putting things down on paper and um and you really had to to have a strong um understanding of theory um before even getting into that in order to um you know, to know what, what things were going to sound like. And you know, a lot of times, if you wanted to like test things out, you had to go to a piano and try things out to see if it was going to, the voicings were going to sound the way you wanted. Um, and I think all those are, are valuable tools and aspects. And especially if you're going to be a, become a professional composer, learning all that stuff is super important. But by having access to digital notation uh, tech, kids can just try things out in real time and they don't necessarily have to know, you know, what, you know, that they're, they're using a, um, a German six chord or whatever, you know, they don't have to know that stuff. They just are like, okay, I'm trying to get it to sound like this and they can plug in these notes and they can be like, Oh, there, it sounds like what I was looking for. And so they're getting it, not necessarily the, the theoretical background that somebody like me or Thomas had to go through in college, but they're getting a much more hands-on direct um, experience with like with direct feedback of like, Oh, I put in these notes and they sound like this. And that's, that's the sound I'm going for. Um, and so by the nature of that, um, what I think it, what I think it does is a lot more kids are experiencing arranging than would have uh, in, in the old days. Um, and, and also experiencing uh, and, kind of a different type of introduction to music theory than, than we would have experienced in the, in the old days. Um, they're getting to like, look at it really from more of a, a real time applied standpoint. And then think about when you were learning to talk 
um, you know, you didn't learn to read before you could talk, right? Or you didn't learn to write an essay before you could, um, you know, before you could talk. You were making sounds and, and trying that stuff out when you were like a toddler. And then as you develop that more than then when you did start writing, you're like, oh, I'm writing this down because it's supposed to, you know, when I write the word the, I'm using that TH because it makes the, the sound and then the E creates the uh, the. And so there I've, I've, I know what I'm doing with it. So I think that the, the music notation has allowed arrangement to, to follow a much more um, natural um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Organic flow in, in the, uh, uh, in kind of the educational aspect of, of, of learning music theory. Um, it may in some ways hinder some people because they, it's, it almost feels like a shortcut and you can't, you know, so why should I learn what a German sixth chord is? If I, uh, already got the sound that I want to, to sound. I don't need to know what that looks like or sounds like. So I could see that argument too, but I think uh, just the fact that it's getting more kids exposed to, to it, um, it's, it's still a valuable thing. Um, I've got kids right now who are working on uh, some uh, music production DAWs, the DAWs, uh, I don't know if anybody uses any of those, the digital audio workstation software. Um, we've got kids that are working with Ableton. We've got kids that are working with uh, Logic Pro and uh, the, the kids that don't have access to those types of programs are all working on a, um, a net-based um, DAW called Soundtrap. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Soundtrap or not, but um, actually my, my rock band ensemble for the greater part of the the third term wasn't uh, able to get together as a group. So um, one of the art teachers came to me and said, hey, can we get some uh, music for this virtual art show that I'm putting together? And I said, sure. And so I assigned the, um, the rock band kids to all create digital original music compositions. And so they're using, um, you know, I gave them kind of opportunities to, to select which interface was going to work best for them. And they're, some of them are using GarageBand, some of them are using Soundtrap, some are using Ableton, some are using um, Logic Pro. But every kid in that group is, has been creating um, just short, like 30 second to one minute long original compositions that are gonna accompany the, uh, the virtual art show. So that's been, uh, you know, we, we've definitely tried to, to, you know, find ways to use technology to our advantage. Um, I'll, I know we're, we're running low on time here, so I want to address technology and COVID. And, um, and in particular, um, my region um, in, in rural Appalachia, one thing that's uh, uh, kind of a, a sticking point for us is that we have horrible internet. Um, uh, my, the, the internet that I'm talking with you on right now is, is my home internet and um, I'm having a good night. It hasn't cut out on us. Um, and it, I'm going to do real quick while I'm talking, I can continue to, to go over things, but I'm going to do a speed test just to be able to show you kind of what, what I'm dealing with there and, and how, how technology has, has been a blessing and a curse for us. But uh, while I'm doing this, what, what uh, Robert, what, internet speeds do you typically get um i'm on google fiber so my ping is usually three or four which is great it's even yes. better than uh, i mean it's fantastic because that means that you're you're just getting everything uh and uh, the, the the actual speed the download speed is usually around close to a thousand nine hundred and something eight eight hundred you know to nine hundred depending on the time and then upload speed around six or seven hundred that's great. That's true. So um, my um, I just just did a or I'm, I'm in the process of doing a speed test and um, it's, it's finishing the upload speed here. But my ping currently my ping is currently 340. Jesus. <laughs> oh my, God. my download is 2.86. And my upload is 0.15. And this is a good this is a good night. So um, it, 
I, the reason I bring that up is that it has caused um, kind of a situation <laughs> yeah, it's measured on a calendar. Sundial is more like it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, the uh, the situation there is that a lot of times it, people in my area and some of my students have even worse internet than I do. And um, so with that, you know, trying to collaborate online has been an issue. Another issue that we've dealt with is that our our schools have a one-to-one -one device um, initiative to where every kid, and this like we started this before COVID, we we were like ahead of the the game compared to a lot of other places. But uh, all of our all of our students have Chromebooks that are issued to them from the school, and that's been going on for years, um, which is great. But the problem with the the Chrome operating system is that it inherently has uh, latency issues with all DAW software, anything, any digital audio workstation software that will work with the Chrome, uh, Chrome OS. Um, it, it, it has significant latency issues, even if you have good internet. Um, so the problem with that is that I had originally planned to do collaborative um, music production projects with my kids. And um, it turned out that, that was not going to be able to happen because people couldn't use monitoring. So like if the, just to clarify, um, if I had somebody lay down like a, a drum track and then send it to somebody else to say, put down a bass track, the bass player couldn't put on headphones and listen to the drum track and then record his bass track because of the Chrome operating systems latency issues. Um, so I, I had to like can that and we just had to do everything digitally. Um, so people aren't listening to real instruments with, uh, uh, with monitors just because it wouldn't work. Um, and that, that was a, was a bummer. Cause I had kids that were ready to like, you know, we, we actually had a group that at the beginning of the year that was like this close to uh, uh, doing our own version of uh, Frank Sinatra's fly me to the moon. And um, I'm a, like, I had uh, a kid that was going to cover all, like my son, Cedric is a, is a brass player. He was going to cover all the trombone parts. Um, he already, he learned all the trombone parts. He was ready to record them. But when he went to record one of them, he, he got one down and he was going to listen to the, listen to that and use it as a monitor to record the other parts. And when he went to do that, um, it, the monitor wouldn't work. Or if it did, it, it was, it was so behind so he couldn't line up his trombone parts. Um, same thing happened for the trumpet player that was going to uh, cover all the trumpet parts and the sax player was going to cover all the sax parts. Um, you know, keep in mind, this is the rock band. So we only had the three horn players in there. We didn't have a, a, a full like big band horn section, but we were going to make a big band horn section just by overdubbing you know, those kids playing the different parts. But the technology wouldn't allow us to do that. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to look over some things here. Presentation, very positive and hopeful. Sounds like you create an environment that's tremendously positive for kids participating in your program. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it work. Uh, and Thomas, let's see here. Uh, now that we're moving, things are moving back towards normal. What's your plan to get your program back to speed where things were before? What prep work have you done to smooth that process? Wow. This is going to be a great question to end on because I know we have like three minutes left. Thomas, um, thank you so much for the question. The, um, the answer to that actually goes greatly along with the, the topic of my whole presentation. I've put together what I've called, uh, I know we're not quite post COVID yet, but hopefully we're heading that way, but I've put together a, um, a student group that's called a, that I've called a post COVID, um, uh, let's see what, what I'm trying to, what, what I've named it now, um, steering committee, post COVID steering committee. And um, anyway, the the whole thing with that is that we're polling kids and finding out, OK, what do you, students, what do you feel like are the big issues that we're going to have to work around as we come out of this? And we've come up with, you know, we know we're going to have to put a heavier emphasis on recruiting. We're going to have to put a stronger emphasis on um, you know, bringing kids up to speed because everybody's had a much more limited band experience 
in, uh, over this past year than they would have had in a, a regular year. So we may have to scale back some of our uh, performance expectations at the same time trying to elevate the students um, to, to the level they need to be on. We're going to have a lot of kids who are discouraged and maybe don't want to continue because they weren't able to do as much this past year, particularly the middle school kids who are like, you know, just unclear about what what their future is going to be like. And maybe they didn't have a, a great band experience this year. So we've got to look at how, to, how we're going to get them involved. And um, all of this goes back to, you know, giving the students the the opportunity to, to really steer this, because I think they're the ones who are going to have the best ideas to get their peers involved and, and to, to bring things up to up to the levels that we're expecting. Um, let's see. All right, guys, I, we are almost out of time. I, I'm looking to see, I, Warwick, I appreciate your comments there. You've been really, really good at, at the comments. Everybody who's given the uh, comments on anything, uh, Thomas and Robert, you guys, Warren, everybody who's been involved here, um, just awesome comments. Great job driving the discussion. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me any further, I'm going to put my email address. Uh, no, that was to Warren. I meant uh, uh, to work rather. I mean, I need to make it to everybody. How do I do that? Everyone. You Let's click see. on that and scroll up. I got it. Yeah. And while he's doing that, I'm going to bring up our poll just so we can collect a little bit of data. And thank you for doing this. This was really great. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it's been fantastic, Jim. I've, I've really enjoyed it. While you're doing that, Jim, I'll, I'll just share with you a lot of the topics <clears throat> that you either touched on directly or alluded to are things that Robert um, has in, in some way incorporated or tried to incorporate through his tenure with the uh, Austin Civic Wind Ensemble. And he and I have talked about this at length, um, sometimes hearing the same thing, but from a different perspective or a different person, it really reinforces uh, the goal. <clears throat> In every ensemble, there's more ways to uh, delegate the ownership so that more people can feel involved, that they matter. Um, and some people like one of the comments there is, um, you know, some people there, all they want to do, all they need is to just show up and play their horns. So there's, there's room for a little bit of everything in this group. Um, you know, I just touched on some of the jobs that people do. There's a lot more. Our membership person um, brings uh, uh, whips and chains and beats money out of people every week or month, every when, when it's due. Um, you know, we have folks who their their sole purpose is to find the venues for us to play in for each concert series. Um, but hearing it from someone else, and also, you know, it's it's uh, Warwick. I think has probably um, touched on a lot of those things. It's nice seeing um, what a feeder program to a community band <laughs> is is doing out there these days. Um, and what I, the, one of the reasons I reached out to you and Steve Petrucci is you guys teach in these um, socioeconomic kind of lower areas and you, you have to do a lot with very limited resources. And sometimes a community band, this, this community band has more resources than any that I've been in so far, but there are still times where, you know, you make decisions. Do we buy new timpani or do we... Um, you know, do we buy new music? And, and we're fortunate that sometimes few years we can do both or, you know, do everything that's on our financial docket. But uh, you touching on a lot of these issues, it's like, okay, these are, these are things that people are still dealing with, especially coming from the rural parts of Appalachia. Um, you know, it's even more amazing what you're able to do on very limited resources, funds, and um, personnel. You know, you're the one man show there pretty much. Yep. Well, I, again, I certainly appreciate you guys having me on. Um, if I did put my, um, my email and if anybody wants to reach out to me on social media, probably Facebook's the best place to catch me. Uh, 
I'm Jim Alder on Facebook and uh, and through Facebook Messenger. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter, but not very much. So I you know, wouldn't wouldn't fuss with that too much. But anyway, I, I love networking, meeting new people. So, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> that would be awesome. All right. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for staying up late. And um, is that uh, anyone have any questions, parting questions or comments or concerns, criticisms? Uh, great job. Thank you guys. Thanks to everybody for putting this together. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I thought Thank it was you. terrific. Thank you. Yeah, this was great, Jim. Thanks. I'm looking at Caroline's thing here real quick. All of this is management and leadership. Typically, seniors will be your leaders and have the confidence to offer to help the younger, less experienced students. And whether the students become musicians, all these skills will be important to their success. Yes. Uh, one last thought for less experienced students. Is it important to play half notes and quarter notes in the proper place than to have them play 16th fast in the wrong place? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is important to have them uh, play half notes and quarter notes in the proper place. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, Caroline, you're, you're exactly right. And um, uh, that's sometimes doing uh, some, some edits, uh, edits in the arrangements to allow somebody to be successful on a, uh, you know, in a different place in their scaffolding is a, is, is a big part of what we do. And I'm sure that's something that can be done in the, you know, at, at all levels, really at the, the, the high school level, the community band level, wherever we happen to be. All right, guys, thank you again so much. Um, and uh, I, like I said before, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you want to extend the discussion. Okay. Have a good night, Jim. Thanks for coming. Hey, good night. Good night. Good night. Right, before everybody goes, just a reminder, next week is a week off. We will not have a master class next Tuesday. The last one for uh, the spring series will be on the 20th of April with Chastine Hoffmeister. And I'll make sure to send out an email for that, um, you know, a couple days before we start that. But otherwise, um, you'll have a week off next Tuesday. So enjoy that time and we will see you for the last uh, master class on the 20th of april i'm glad you said that i put it on the wrong date on my calendar <laughs> no worries <laughs> all right have a good night everyone good night Bye. thanks a lot folks thanks